Welcome everyone. I'm very excited for the uh, conversation that will be taking place today. My name is Tamara Smallwood and I have the privilege of supporting Evo Sports Collective. Um, so Evo is where we play and explore the intersection of sports, consciousness, and social action. And one of the ways we do that is through mental, emotional, and flow state training, helping improve the flow state and lives of those who participate with us. So our master series is a collection of the people who have been pioneers, leaders, and innovators in all of those spaces. Um, and today we are very honored to be welcoming Sean O'Leary in conversation with one of our co-founders, Barry Robbins. Uh, they will be introducing us to the warrior spirit of hurling and exploring the multifaceted dimensions of sports along the way today. So we are very honored and excited to have Sean on this call and welcome everyone to please put any uh, questions or comments that you may have in the chat along the way. And we will touch on uh, any questions in the Q&A portion of the call later on. So over to you, Greg, to tap us in. Thank you, Tamara. Thank you all for joining I want to bring us into the call and to the present moment so that we're truly focused and engaged so that we can be great listeners and learners and very threatening that we may actually elevate and levitate. So get ready. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> and just on the end, I will take us around the EFT tapping points, the intention is to relax your body, calm your mind. It's a very useful 90 seconds just prior to participation in anything. And we've been tuning in more for the last couple of months to energy and emotional freedom technique with our master series calls. And it's fun to know connected to sport that David Megacy's sister-in-law, Catherine Witchery, just last Friday won her second world rowing championship in a single boat and won by 12 seconds. Wow. So that's, um, and she has re-embraced tapping. So with that said and that excited. <laughs> Way to go. Coach. We'll bring tapping into hurling. Yes, good. <laughs> so here we go. I'm just going to invite you to join me Tapping energy points, I will make an intentional statement at each point. Please tune in to the intentional statement as I go around, and we'll take just about 90 seconds here. So the first point is at your eyebrows, and the statement is, I choose to let go of all noticed and unnoticed nerves or tension as I join this call side of eye on the eye socket. I choose to let go of all noticed and unnoticed, unproductive or negative thinking. And under eye, on your cheekbone, I choose to let go of all noticed and unnoticed doubt about my ability to come fully present for this call. Top lip, I choose to transform that energy into a powerfully focused performance during this call. And the crease of your chin under your bottom lip, I choose to easily move now into the flow of the call and our collective energy. Collarbone point, I choose to be calm from start to finish, relaxed body, calm mind. Point on your sternum over your thymus gland. I choose to be energetic from start to finish. Point on your ribs. I choose to be focused and fully present from start to finish as we all contribute to a collective unifying energy. Under arm, I choose to let my participation be Fun and effortless. And then hand points, if I was going to shake hands, but just rotate my hand with fingers separate, I'm just tapping by each fingernail, starting with the thumb. I choose to be clear-minded from start to finish. Index finger, I choose to easily process 
and connect with the content of our call. In middle finger, I choose to be heart-centered. In ring finger, I choose to let go of any lingering anxiousness from my life outside of this call as I move more fully into the present moment of this call. And little finger, I choose to be fully intuitive and sense and know the just right ways to contribute to our collective unifying energy. Inside of the hand, I choose to honor and appreciate myself for taking time to join in this collective as we all look to elevate the world, evolve in the world. If you let yourself be still, please, inhaling through your nose. Hold, 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 and fully exhale through your nose or mouth. A recent practice is to imagine that you can touch your backbone with your belly button as you're fully exhaling. And then please join us at your own pace. Notice all of the beautiful people on this call and get ready for an adventure in the sports world that not many people know about. But I want to know more about it. Thank you all. Nice, Craig. Thank, thank you, Greg. Lovely. I just really appreciate uh, the opportunity to drop in through your good practice. And uh, in part, that's what Evo is all about, folks. I'm the co-founder, one of the co-founders of Evo, and welcome to the call. Uh, part of it is the direct experience, the Gnostic direct experience of life, of practice. And we have the opportunity to have that right on this call, even though it's a Zoom call. We want it to be experiential. We're going to have some videos for you. We're going to have some practice. And uh, let me just mention the format. It's a 90-minute call, and uh, we're going to have a discussion with Father Sean and myself first, and then we're going to open it up to Q&A. There'll be some practice as well, and we invite you to share any comments, thoughts, questions that you have, and use the chat because we'll be focusing on uh, uh, using the chat uh, as a repository for uh, Father Sean. And as Tamara said, uh, this is the uh, Evolutionary Sports Collective's Master's Series. And we want, our goal, our intention is to bring forth remarkable people. And we certainly have one today in Father Sean O'Leary. Thank you, Sean, for joining us. It's much appreciated. Um, the um, idea is for us is to step into the cutting edge of sports, of fitness, of exercise, of movement. It's all of those things. And secondly, to have conversations, to talk about sports as a vehicle for personal and social change. And as our name implies, well, we want to stimulate you. And in doing so, stimulate ourselves. We want to stretch people. We want to create insights and share uh, ourselves and our thoughts as a community, as a practice community. And by so doing, further the evolution of the species. And lastly, we want to have fun. We want to have a good time. <laughs> so uh, we're here together to do that. And uh, very briefly, Sean and I met 25 years ago or so when both of us caught fire uh, in the integral movement, which was brought forth uh, here in the West, primarily by uh, Michael Murphy, George Leonard, and Ken Wilber. And, uh, well, we were doing a, a workshop, an integral workshop, and Sean and I met. And, you know, you have one of those uh, instances where you just fall in love, and that was it. And uh, we've done a lot of work together. And then recently, Sean, I think over the last couple of years, we've really reconnected and uh, done some really nice work together. And it's just a 
treat. It's just a pleasure to have you on this call. I consider you to be a true visionary, a real mystical soul, and somebody who's way ahead of their time. So, Sean, welcome to the call. And one more thing I want to ask people, by the way, before this call and before our emails, if by raising a hands or in chat, how many people have heard or are familiar with the sport of hurling? Sean, you don't count. Uh, <laughs> so I'm maybe to the hands that are up. <laughs> you put your hands up. You want to increase the count? <laughs> There's some voting irregularities going on here, but we won't talk about that. <laughs> At any rate, not so many. I, I mean, I yeah. never heard of this sport, I've, and I've I've heard of a lot of sports. So uh, this is good background for us to understand. And Sean, perhaps I want to turn it over to you. We'll just step right into this conversation. Right. So I'd like to start with a, a three-minute clip, and then I'll comment on the various logistics of what you've just seen. And then we can open up to a, a discussion between Barry and myself and then Q&A. Yeah. Michael, so do you want to play that first clip? Okay. <laughs> wow. So this this is what the sticks look like. In Gaelic, we call them a common, and it's made from the ash tree. And I don't know if you can see it closely, but you have to get the grain going this way, otherwise the thing's gonna break. So um and the, this band holds it together. And the ball is about the size like the size of a baseball. And this ball is traveling about 95 miles an hour when it's well, well struck. So the field itself is is much bigger than an NFL football field. So typically, you're talking about 160 yards long by about 90 yards wide. And the game is played in two 35-minute sections with a 15-minute break in between. And there are 15 people on each team. You've got a goalkeeper, you've got six backs, two center field, and uh, six forwards. And um, you're allowed five substitutes in the course of the game. 
And this can be because somebody got injured or for tactical reasons, you want to put on somebody who's more suited to the particular day. No, you saw them all wearing helmets. That only came in in the 1970s. So when I was playing hurling, there was no protection whatsoever. There was no, nothing worn on the head. Um, so it was a hell for leather. Um, as you were taking your life in your hands, if you were good at it, you were able to protect yourself with the hurley so that you weren't, you weren't struck. So part of the trick was to stay close enough to the guy you're marking so that you don't get the tail end of the swing and get hit in the head. But in spite of that, I probably, I got stitches all over my body from, I played it from the time I was a little child until I went to Africa at age 26. Um, and so that gives you a little bit like uh, what, are the kind of the, what, what it looks like in the field. It's an ancient, ancient game. It's first mentioned actually in the year 1287 BCE um, yeah. when two, two groups, the Connacht group and the Munster group, two provinces were playing each other. And there's a great story about a young Irish warrior called Setanta. And he's, he's living a little before the time of Christ. And he's a, a warrior in training, a young man. He's a teenager. And he's invited to the castle of a guy called Colin. And Colin is training these young warriors. And he's got his vicious uh, Irish wolfhound. If you've seen these wolfhounds, they're, they're, as, they're as big as a small pony. And this guy had a vicious wolfhound that everybody was afraid of, including the warriors. So he's throwing this big party for the young warriors and he warns them all, be here before five o'clock because I'm going to re release the hound at five o'clock to guard my premises. But one of the young warriors, a guy called Satanta, was late. And uh, Colin had released the hound and the rest of them are inside having a feast and they heard this uh, extraordinary kilele outside, this dog roaring viciously, tearing somebody asunder. And he said, oh my God, Satanta has arrived and uh, the, 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 the hound has just dismembered him. And they go outside, and the hound is dead. And Satanta's there, and he's got his hurley. And as the hound was coming towards him, he took the ball, and he struck it so accurately and with so much force, it went straight into the hound's mouth and killed the hound. And Cullen is really upset about this. This was his, his, his guard dog. And so Satanta said to him, I will become your guard dog. So he called himself Ku Cullen, which means the hound of Cullen. And he becomes one of the greatest archetypal heroes in Irish mythology. He's called Cúchalan. So he's an expert at hurling uh, way, way back then. Now, the interesting thing I mentioned was that Ireland was also famous for its uh, playing chess games way, way back at that stage. So there's another great story from slightly before the time of Christ of uh, the leader of a band called the Fiona. And the Fiona were the warriors who protected Ireland, particularly against the Vikings. And uh, the leader of was a guy called Fionn Macol, Fionn, the son of Cool. And at this stage, he's in his 40s, but he's still the leader of the group. And his wife has recently died. And they're trying to make a match for him. They're trying to get a suitable wife for him. So they make a match with him, uh, for him with the uh, daughter of the High King of Ireland. And so they throw this huge big party. It's a three-night party. And at the end of three days, they're going to get married. And so the, all the warriors in this big, big, big hall and the queen and the king and their daughter and Fionn are sitting at the top table and they're drinking mead, which is kind of a, a kind of a wine. And all of a sudden, this young woman, uh, uh, her name is Gráinne, and she spots a warrior away in the group, a guy called Diarmid Mac Dirna. And Diarmid has a spot on his forehead, which in Gaelic is called the Baul Sherka, which means the love spot. And any woman who sees it is going to fall instantly in love with him. So he has to wear bangs to keep himself out of trouble. So he's sitting in the hall with the warriors and the Gronya spots him and she falls instantly in love with him. So she spikes the wine and gives it to her father and uh, her mother and to Fionn and they fall asleep at the top table. And then she goes down to Diarmuid and she says, there's no English translation for this now. She said to him, Khrim The nearest thing is, I put you on your honor as a warrior. Take me out of this place. Take me away and marry me. And Dilma says, I can't do it. You know, you're, you're getting married to the leader of the group. You know, everybody's going to be, they're going to chase us down. There's no place that we can hide. She said, I don't give a damn. I put you on your honor as a warrior. Take me and marry me and get me out of this place. So there's a druid present there. And they say to the druid, what are we going to do? And the druid says, well, I can give you this piece of advice. Fiona's going to chase you down implacably. 
for the rest of your life. And so here's what you need to do. Never cook your meal where you kill the prey. And never eat your meal where you cook it. And never sleep where you eat your meal. And never sleep in the same place twice. Never climb a tree that only has one trunk. And never enter a cave that has only one exit. No, good luck. And so Dioma goes off and he's trying to avoid fun for the next seven years. And at one stage, he and Gronya are in this huge big oak tree and Fionn comes by with the warriors and they sit underneath it and they take out the chessboard and they start to play chess. Now, Fionn was a, was a great chess player, but Diarmid was the best in the country. So Diarmid is watching this game happening and he sees that Fionn is going to win. So he takes an acorn from the tree on which he's sitting and he drops it onto the piece that Fionn's opponent should move in order to have a chance of winning the game. So he drops it right on the piece exactly accurately, and the guy realizes, oh, that's the piece I need to move. And Fionn immediately realized only Diarmid would know that move. He looks up into the tree and he says, Diarmid, I can't see you, but I'm, gonna, I'm coming for you. And so both um, chess and hurling go back, you know, to then. And as I said in my kind of uh, prologue that I wrote down, in some senses, chess, you know, and uh, genocidal warfare are the two ends of the spectrum. So we have invented sports that lie somewhere in between. So there are some sorts which are very, very easy, you know, nobody gets injured, there's maybe a golf game or something like that. And then there's at the other end, like NFL or rugby or hurling, and it's open warfare. Now the question then becomes, how can you play this game in a way that honors not just your physical prowess, not just your, no, your mental acuity, but that your, your spirit is part of it. And I will lead us through that eventually. How do you use your sport as a way, not just um, to create glory for yourself, not just to develop your physiology, not even your aerobic capacity, not, not even your mental acuity, not even just your intuitive capacities, but how do you do this, in fact, to grow your spirit? the reason why you incarnated on planet Earth. And sociologically, how do you use your game not just to entertain others, but to inspire others? And to inspire means, to inspiration means the spirit within. How do you activate the spirit in, uh, in your fellow players or in the audience that's watching it so that you're not just simply entertaining them, but that you're helping them to evolve? So that's what well I hope said. we'll go through. Well said. Thank you, Sean. You know, uh, sure. these anecdotal stories, uh, and these mythical stories are very useful in setting the context as the sport goes back to, as you said, 1200 uh, BCE and the nice tie in with chess, because, you know, these <clears throat> days, uh, what you hear in, in the world of sports and athletics and competition is that when all things are equal yes. physically, it's a chess match. Yes. And you hear announcers talk about that over and over again. I want to <laughs> just loop back a little bit to your explanation of the game. There's a lot here to talk about. First off, um, there's no offsides in this game. Is that correct? No, you can. Any player can be anywhere in the field. There's a small little box around the goalkeeper, and you can't get into that box before the ball arrives. But every, apart from that, the entire field is your kind of is open yeah. to you. Now, speaking of the goalkeeper, uh, the only piece of uh, protective equipment he has is a helmet, which was just uh, brought on in the 70s. Right. The ball is traveling at 95 miles an hour. I have to believe this. The goalkeepers are uh, something on the sadomasochistic side <laughs> that, uh, you know, would be the only people to be. I would be behind the net rather than in, <laughs> in front of the net as far as that goes. But now some of these rules are interesting. Uh, you can carry the ball on the stick right. for the entire length. But in yes. terms of running with the ball, yep. what's the rule there? You can bounce it. You can bounce it as you're running, or you can hold it and balance it as you're running. And you see some of these guys, and in the second clip, you'll see that. The ability to run at top speed, balancing a ball, while people are clobbering you from behind and trying to knock you down. So that's and a now great what about skill. carrying the ball in your hand? You can, you can hold the ball in your hand for three paces, and then you either have to hit it against the ground and catch it again, you know, or get rid of it. But you can't run more than four, three paces with the ball in your hand. Right. And what yeah. you said to me... Uh, about the speed of the sport is really interesting. Right. It's the fastest field game in the world. On grass, which is remarkable. So there's a certain amount of rigor and training yes. uh, about this. And so before you entered into the church, you were involved in this uh, form of, of practice. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. I played it actually even when I was in the seminary. 
until I left for Africa at age 26. So even when I was in college and I was in, in, the, in the seminary, I still played hurling uh, competitively. And uh, there's something to be said here about uh, these uh, 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 regional rivalries. Now, yes, yes. Uh, maybe you could tell us a little about that and the, and the colors that you're wearing. Right. So this is the color of County Cork. Uh, so um, the interesting thing is that this is a completely amateur sport. The level of uh, training is professional at this stage, but it is amateur. There's not a single penny changes hands. And so these are guys who are spending nine months of the year, you know, in all kinds of uh, fitness training, aerobic training, strength training, you know, cutting back on alcohol consumption, looking at their diets, you know, not smoking. And they're doing this for the love of the game. But basically you start off at, in my case, for instance, I live in a small little village. There's maybe 15 streets in it. So they start off what's called street leagues. So at age 11, I, I'm competing against guys from other streets. So they're organizing street leagues to try to train guys. And they start really, really early. And then they'll pick a, a, a team for the whole village by age 14. So there's under 14, and then under 16, and then under 18. And if you're good enough, then you get to play what's called senior. But senior doesn't mean elder. It means kind of a, a professional level abilities. So the really cream of the crop get to play play senior. So you're kind of you're encouraged all the ways up, and you know the village supports you. The women, the mothers are washing the jerseys, you know. So everybody is involved in this. So in some senses, the uh, the village is like how would I put it? It's like it is like the amniotic fluid in which you're born, carried you know, uh, throughout your entire lifetime, and mostly you're going to spend your entire life in the village. So before and during and after your career, you know, you're still with the same people. So you're doing this for the love of the village. And then if you're good enough, maybe you get picked for the, uh, for the county and you're representing your entire county. And so in some senses, because you can't shift alliances, you can't be traded to another team, it's a lifelong commitment. And therefore the, uh, the, the level of involvement of the community is totally different because they know they have you. You're born there, you're going to live there, you're going to die there, you know, and all you can leave behind you is your reputation, the courage and the commitment and the achievements that you've had. Amazing. Uh, this is sort of the antithesis of, of uh, here in the West. I know, you know, David Megacy were involved in a labor movement for the NFL. Uh -huh. It seemed like anything like this is necessary. And what is it about Cork <laughs> that makes it so prolific in this sport? Right. So Ireland is divided into 32 counties. So Cork is actually geographically the largest, not necessarily the most populous. So Dublin is a smaller county, but it's the, the capital of Ireland, so it's a much bigger population. But um, I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that uh, initially there was a great hero. And I remember, actually, uh, I saw him play many, many times, a guy called Christy Ring. You know, and Christie inspired us in Cork. He won the equivalent of the, um, what would you call the baseball equivalent of the World Series? Won it eight times in his career, 1941, 42, 43, 44, 46, and then 52, 53, 54 again. And my greatest regret was that he retired one year before I would have played against him and I would have been marking him. I was playing for the university, University College Cork, and he was playing for his club team was called the Glen Rovers. And he played right corner forward. And I played left corner back. So I would actually have been marking him for the game. But uh, I played in 1968 for the college team and he retired in 1967. So I was really disappointed. It would be the kind of the highlight of my career to get to play on my on my archetypal hero. But I never got it. So you're saying that he was I mean, this is sort of the Babe Ruth of, of course. Yes. Uh, yes. And so he left that legacy, which is has just carried on as far as yes. court, bringing forth yes. all these remarkable players and, yes. and championships as well. So yes. you could possibly say that uh, he's the Babe Ruth and, and Cork is, are the, uh, is the Yankees right, okay, there you go. <laughs> of, of the Irish League. Right. All right. This is fantastic. Why don't we show the second video yes, and then we're right. going to step into a few more things as well. Right. Turnover. Seamus Harnady needs a hurley, but meanwhile, Alan Connolly has one. Bearing down. He's going for a second goal. Brilliant. Incredible. Goal in the stroke of half time. He gets his second goal with just five minutes into the second half. 
of George Markell. Got the goal after 17 seconds. And this match started at 4 o'clock. Nice turn. Good score. Luke Mead has to give the hand pass. Goes, gets the return. Lovely play. Connolly's going for a hat trick. Oh, my word. Fantastic. Alan Connolly is on fire in Simple Stadium. Long took out again from Patrick Collins. Patrick Horgan to Seamus Harnaday. Oh, magic. The pass from Hoggy to Harnaday. You can hardly see in the blink of an eye. Just watch this. Layoff. Have a shot over the bar. Beautiful. Cork are on a roll. They're steamrolling through Tipperary. Just going for point number four. Yeah. Incredible. Ivor Akar. Incredible. One, two, three, four. Four touches. Jane Kingston. Brilliant. Connor Bow. Well anticipated by Shane Barrett. Trouble with a capital T coming to Tipperary. Hands over towards Patrick Hogan. 1 11 against Limerick. 1 7 against Tipperary. 2 10 against Clay. Thank you, Michael. You know, I'm struck by a couple of things, uh, folks. And by the way, please feel free to use the chat because we're going to do Q&A in a little bit and put in comments, questions, whatever you have. Uh, this is all up for grabs for Father Sean. Uh, first off, I'm struck by the energy of the crowd. Yes, yes. Uh, just, you know, ecstatic, not just mm-hmm. sitting there normally. You know, this is different than a baseball game. This is different than uh, many sports that you watch. It's, there's continuous action. And the crowd uh, seems to completely elevate the players as the players elevate the crowd. So when you were talking about this hallowed uh, name in in, uh, in Irish hurling, you know, it struck me that there are players who are charismatic. Yes. Uh, yes. Certainly here in the West, there's uh, certain players, Michael Jordan. Yes. Uh, Steph Curry, who did the probably yeah. the, the one of the greatest clutch performances in Olympic history in basketball and probably in the NBA. Uh, there's players that just inspire us, but there's also charismatic venues. Yes. There yes. are places and locations that by, by the simple opportunity to step into these locations, yeah. you have this experience, you feel something that's happening. In baseball, uh, you know, people you would say it would be Fenway Park or, uh, or, uh, 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 the Cubs uh, Park as well, Wrigley Field. Um, and this is true, by the way, not only in sports, it's true in religion. Absolutely. Going to a church, going to a Absolutely. synagogue is yeah. a charismatic venue. Right. Right. Um, concert halls, yes. rock and roll, some of the yes. best unitive experiences that I've yeah. ever had. Sean, so maybe we could talk a little bit about that too. I mean, we're going to sort of play around with this. What for you is this impulse for people to go to these events? Why right. why are they there? Obviously, it's to support the local team, but something else is happening there. Right. I think every single one of us needs to kind of some kind of an archetypal hero figure, Barry. You know, it is to kind of pull us beyond kind of the the limitations of our individuality. And so, in the in the uh, practice at the end, I want to talk about this Hindu notion, you know, of the seven levels of body. You know that there's the uh, there's the soul self, there's the psyche body, there's the mental body, there's the astral body, there's the etheric body, and there's the physical body. And I think that a true sports person is able to activate all of these levels. That you know, it's not just about physio- physiological prowess. It's not about just weightlifting so that you're physically in much better shape. There's something about the etheric body, the energy system of the body as well, that can be activated. You know, it's like what homeopathy does or what alternative medicines do. Because, you know, places and people are carriers of energy. Every word you speak uh, has an energy attached to it. Every thought you think has energy attached to it. Every kind of word, every action you engage in has energy. And then there's the the kind of the shared energy and it amplifies each other. If, if you take, for instance, a little kid on a, on a swing, a swing set, you know, and you start pushing it. Now, there's a periodicity of the swing. If you know what the periodicity is, and you can push accordingly, so you wait until the swing comes back to you, and when it's at the very end, then you push, then you can amplify the swing. You can, you can do a loop-to-loop. If you push too quickly, you're impeding the swing. So there's a, there's a natural periodicity of energies. 
And when they're in sync together, you get this extraordinary kind of uh, amplification. So when you get a lot of people together, you know, through the, the, the rituals, because it is a ritual. You think, for instance, that like an NFL game, there's a kind of a, a pre-game ritual, you know, the tailgate party. So that's an important part of it. There are the chants that people engage in. There's the colors of the uniforms. There's, you know, kind of the, um, the, the function of the referees. So the whole thing actually is a liturgy. And uh, people, you know, they're activated by ritual and by liturgy because now you see people doing this wave, for instance, the, the spectators. How does that wave happen? It, it basically is a sine wave that's actually being created, you know, physically in the, in, the, in the audience, you know, and it's totally in sync. I remember one time I was back from Kenya and I attended a charismatic renewal conference in Dublin in which there were 5,000 people and somebody started singing in tongues. And 5,000 people picked up on it. There was no conductor. There was no words spoken to it. But there was an energy that went through the group. It started, you know, it swelled. It kind of, there was an extraordinary cadence to it. And then it just tailed off after about three minutes. And there was nobody kind of orchestrating it. It was like the energy had an intelligence of its own. And that's what happened, I believe, when, when you get a crowd of people together with a kind of a, um, a, a focused intentionality as a group you're creating an energy that's actually absorbed and soaked by the, the venue itself. Not only do the participants go home, the competitors and the audience, not, do, not only do they go home with their energy systems charged up, but the actual physical venue, the, the, literally the, the grass in the field is imbued with the energy of the encounters. And so after a period of time, when you get a lot of great games played in a particular venue, there's a sanctity, it's a holy place. What we call in Gaelic, we have a term for it, it's called uh, a chyolite, a thin place, a place where the veil between the mystical and the mundane is diaphanous and you can move through it. Now, you can create those thin places by intentionality and especially by kind of a shared intentionality. So you go into these kind of hallowed venues and literally the very, the very turf on which you're walking is emanating the energy of past and previous encounters. Ah, oh, beautiful. So, yeah, there's a... Uh... There's a lineage and a transmission that occurred right. in these venues, this, these, these uh, halls of uh, hallowed halls, rarefied air um, of transmission. And um, I think, as you said, there's something here that sort of translates into life itself, which is one of the great lessons of sport is that we can take it into everyday life about the idea of having unit of experiences right. of becoming one. Yes. And, uh, I think you see this with when crowds recognize that something yes. remarkable is going on right. and they gravitate to it and they want to be part of it. Right. Uh, so the players, again, it's infectious. Uh, Absolutely. Their, their play and on this field have an impact on the crowd, which in turn right. has an impact on the players. So both of these yeah. uh, groups are elevated uh, to the point where they do experience non-dual yeah. unity consciousness. Absolutely. 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 They're feeding off each other. And so I use the image sometimes of, you know, in um, satellite technology and sending rockets into space, uh, distance traveling out to, to Pluto and places like that. There's an effect that kind of astrophysicists use called the slingshot effect, where in order to project something into a great distance into space, you use the gravitational attraction of some of the planets that you're kind of passing on route. So you're having them swing around it so that the gravity of the eventual planets are actually accelerating the trajectory of the missile that you're sending out. Now, I think in some senses, when you're playing against a worthy opponent as in an individual level or as a team level, the objective of the exercise is to use the opponent's skill set as a slingshot to improve your own abilities and your own performances. So it's not just about winning and beating the opposition. It's about emulating the talent that you're finding on the other side, and individual talent and kind of and team talent. And so for me, that is the sociological import of, of, of sports, of group sports, that you're actually encouraging each other to develop the skill set. It's not about beating them so much as learning from them. And so I love this notion of looking at the opposition as a slingshot to improve my own ability as an individual and as a team. And that, for it, Sean, you, you just hit on, we've talked about this before, that this is the true meaning of competition. Absolutely. That this Absolutely. is the idea that uh, perhaps in our lives we can make each other better. We exactly. can bring out the best in each other. Absolutely. And the sports is this beautiful opportunity to do that. Uh, 
And I think that uh, some of the highest compliments uh, have been uh, after a game when the teams pass each other to shake hands, somebody would say, you know, you elevated my game. You brought the best out in me. And so there's something to be said about that. And there's something to be said about playing to the highest of your potential. Yes. Forget yes. about winning or losing. I yes. mean, some of the best games I ever pitched, I lost one to nothing. Yes. But I, yes. I, that was as good as I could be. Right. So uh, it flips the switch on this this Western notion of competition in, the ser- in terms of I win, you lose zero sum games to something that's grander, that's larger, yes. that that sports can serve to elevate. And I'm just wondering, because we're going to switch gears a little bit here. Uh, when you take a journey back into those days when you played and all the experiences that you have, what do you take away? What are some of the most memorable experiences or the greater meaning that you've gotten out of participating in this really remarkable sport? Right. Well, obviously, the camaraderie that you build up uh, by being part of a team over an extended period of time, beginning in the village, you know, beginning actually with the streets in which you were born. So the street leagues where there's like 15 other boys around your same, same age that are playing in competitions together. So we had, uh, how do we even pick teams, you know, on the street ourselves? So we had this, this technique where everybody had a hurley, one of these hurleys. And so they'd all be thrown in together in a pile. And then we'd blindfold one person and this guy had to pick out the, the hurleys one by one, left hand, right hand, to the left and to the right. So that, you know, it was a totally kind of, um, in some senses, a random distribution. So whatever the hurley landed, that you were part of that team. And so that's how we chose the teams on the streets. So you could be um, in a totally different team every day you, you played. And so you had to learn how to work with whatever team you were assigned on the basis of the random distribution of the hurleys by a guy who was blindfolded. And so the ability just to um, to harvest whatever the reality was. And I think that for me, that as a, as a priest, that's a very, very important thing. Let me just do a slight digression here. Christ is one of the greatest teachers of paradox I've ever come across. He loves these kind of... Uh, paradoxical situations. He tells this story one time about, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a, um, a very rich man who had a steward who was in charge of his property. And he found out after a few years that this guy was embezzling his property. So he calls him to an accountant. He says, I believe you've been embezzling my property. I need an accountant. I need to see the books. And the guy says, holy God, what am I going to do now? I'm too old to get a real job. I'm too embarrassed to beg. What am I going to do? So he calls on all his matters and he says, you know, um, Barry, how much do you owe my master? And Barry says, uh, five gallons of wine. He says, take your bill and make it three. You know, tomorrow, how much do you owe my master? I have Ten bushels of wheat. Take your bill and make it eight. And then Christ said a very strange thing. He said, the master praised the unjust steward insofar as he had acted wisely because the children of this generation are wiser to their kind than the children of light. Now, was he praising this guy's duplicity? Absolutely not. He was saying, look at this guy. He could turn every single situation to his own economic advantage. When he was working, he was creaming it off. But even when he got fired, he was able to bribe the debtors so he could you know, pick a little back shishi when he was finished. So Jesus is saying, why can't you do that with life? There is no situation in which you find yourself. There's no relationship of which you are a part. There's no event that happens to you that cannot be harvested for spiritual and psychological evolution. And so that was the kind of the lesson I got, even as a small child, okay? The Hurleys came out this way. Now you're part of this team. You might be with you know, six of the worst players and all the good guys are on the other side. That's how the Hurleys came out. What are you going to do about it? You know, how do you harvest that situation? So again and again and again, it was, okay, I'm a member of a different team, different circumstances. Now I'm playing, you know, at the senior level with the university. You know, how do you harvest that? What am I learning, not just about the skill set? What am I learning about winning and losing? What am I learning about the sociology of it? Who's been affected by it? What am I learning about the spirituality of it? How am I using this to grow kind of mystically and, and not just be about the fact of coming up, coming up with, a, with a trophy or a medal? So for me, that's, that's how I've attempted to, not just in the hurling career, but in everything I encounter. How can I harvest this situation? I know I volunteer to be here now. Obviously, I have a mission. What is it? How can I align my mission with the present circumstances? And in sport, that's a great metaphor. You know, as you know yourself, Barry, uh, Hinduism, we call that the, uh, the game of Lila. 
that life itself and incarnation itself is a game. So how do you harvest it, not just for the ego, but sociologically for everybody involved and spiritually for the benefit of growing your own soul? Beautiful, beautiful. It's Lila, the play of the universe. Yes. And and, and Mm -hmm. our play, and you know, uh, Dave Megacy, my good brother who's on this call, is is fond of saying that uh, sport is organized play. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, and here we are playing together on this call. And if you look at the sweep of, of your life from Ireland to here in, in California, um, and there's interesting. I mean, do you, do you see some kinds of parallels where you've taken one thing and subsumed it into the next? You've gone from sports into yeah. the priesthood. Uh, yeah. By your own words, you're a happily excommunicated priest. Yes. Yeah. You have your own spiritual community. You got involved in the integral movement. You now have companions on the journey, yeah. and, and you know, and you also have a, a, a psychology practice. Yeah. What do you see in this? Is there some commonality in this? What are the threads for you, Sean? Yeah, the threads for me is if you don't make the kinds of changes that are going to make you grow, life is going to make them for you. And so, I got thrown out in Kenya after 14 years because of work I was doing in social justice, and the, the most unhappy day of my life was the 20th of May, 1986, when after 14 years living in Kenya and loving it, I was kicked out by the government because I was confronting politicians about um, corruption. I was bringing food in from outside in a time of fa- famine, and a local politician who was an assistant minister in the government was taking the, tr- the, f- the food using government troops, and he was selling it. So I confronted him at public meetings, and I was called in by the, uh, the uh, special branch chief of police. I was given 48 hours to leave. But, and so I was heartbroken, 20th of May, 1986. I can still remember it. And then I spent a year in London studying um, hypnosis and then came to the States and did a PhD in psychology. And then I realized if I hadn't been thrown out of Kenya, I wouldn't have had the opportunities I got in, in California. And then I got thrown out of the, <laughs> the Diocese of San Jose uh, in um, 2010 because I was talking about reincarnation and advocating for women priests. And then I got to found a new community. So in some senses, every time that there was a tragedy in my life, I found I was more and more free. Now I could think what I wanted to think, speak what I wanted to, to speak, and you know believe what I wanted to believe. So every, every tragedy has provided an extraordinary harvest for me. And so whether it's you know, sports or working as a missionary in Kenya or being a psychologist here in California or being the director of a spiritual community, for me, they're all just different games. And the question is, how can I just try to optimize and maximize the benefits for everybody with whom I'm in relationship so that I'm growing myself, but I'm also interested in how am I helping to grow other people? What was the mission I signed up for and how much am I in alignment with that mission? And in this present circumstance, no matter how tragic it may appear to be, how can I harvest that? And when I'm lucky and things are going my way, how can I harvest that? You know, and not get deluded by yeah, by success or defeated by a kind of a failure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is beautiful. This is, as you say, sport and life is a metaphor. And in every moment, it's a metaphor for us to learn from if we have the ability to, to bear witness to what's going on. And I love this these stories because uh, George Leonard is, is fond of saying, take the hit as a gift. Yes, yes. That everything that happens is an opportunity for growth. And, you know, uh, a lot of times, uh, and I, this has been somewhere for me where I had some difficulty. Sometimes it's a badge of honor. Yes. And yes. it allows yes. this growth and evolution. Without it, you would be stuck. Yeah. So the yeah. idea that the, your evolution uh, and everybody on this call, you, you consider your own evolution. Yes. Consider the sweep of your life, where yes. you started in your life and where you've ended up and how you've gotten here. Yep. A lot of times it's organic. A lot yes. of times it's by the gut. Absolutely. It's by your own senses, your own innate and yes. inner feelings that lead you to an area uh, that you might otherwise have not figured out. And, and perhaps it's, it's interesting. You look at, you know, uh, at early age in Cork, could you have ever envisioned where you are right now? Not, not in my wildest dreams. But the thing <laughs> no, is, I'm so glad. Yeah. I'm so glad. Uh, let's yeah. take a look at uh, at the chat. There's some good questions in here. Uh, right. If yeah. you wouldn't mind sure. reading them out loud. And by the way, if you want, whoever is asking the question, uh, if you want to follow that up with a comment or question, we it, we're happy to have this be interactive as well. Absolutely. Yeah. So the the first question was from Steve. 
is hurling the national sport over Irish rules football? Um, it definitely is. It's the older of the two, by far the older of the two. Um, it's not played in as many counties you know, as football, as Gaelic, it's called Gaelic football. There's an Irish version of football with a round ball, a little bit like the soccer ball, except you can handle it. You know, so that's played more frequently than hurling is because hurling is such a specialized skill that if you're not born into a county or a village or an area in which you're learning this from age two, it's a very dangerous game to pick up, you know, when you're a teenager or later. The skill set is so precise, you know, and the uh, the possibility of injuries yeah, real if you don't know how to kind of handle yourself. And so, yes, uh, there are fewer places in which hurling is p- played in Ireland, vis-a-vis kind of a Gaelic football, but nobody nobody uh, would ever argue that that the hurling is far more the skillful of the two. Yeah, thanks for that, Steve. The second question is, do they get paid or are they all amateurs and hold other jobs to make money for family? Right. There's absolutely no money takes, uh, changes hands whatsoever. It's completely amateur which is interesting because the level of training at this stage, when, again, when I was a kid growing up, you know, people were very fit for the, the simple reason that uh, yeah, we all played outside. From the time you were like two or three years old, you, your mother would say to get out. It's a fine sunny day, get out and play. So we didn't have computers. We didn't have cell phones. So we entertained each other by playing hurling. So you're developing this, this skill set. And so you did it for the love of the game. And so these guys now are spending nine months a year developing the kinds of skills which are necessary for this, the aerobic capacity and the weight training and the diet, stuff like that. And there's not a, there's not a single penny changes hand. And so it's for the love of the game and for the privilege of representing your village or your county. That's what drives them. And in fact, obviously, it's a much greater kind of, uh, a much greater uh, kind of draw than just being paid you know, dollars for it. You're doing it because you love it. And you're doing it because you want your community and you do it because you're going to go down in the folklore of the village, not even so much for your achievements as much as for your courage and your commitment. And that's the that's the payback. And that's that's more than enough for these guys. I mean, and the amount of time they put into kind of preparing themselves for the season is amazing. And still not a single penny changes hands. Sean, has hurling played anywhere else in the world? Yeah. Among Irish communities, there are places people in San Francisco play it. It's played in Australia, it's played in England. So wherever you've got a big Irish community, you're going to find uh, some hurling teams there. I noticed the stands were packed. Yes, yes. With, uh, where do they pay tickets to see you guys play? And does the money go to the municipality if that's the case? Or right. how does yeah. the money thing work? Right. And so some of these stadiums, like for instance, the chief or the... Uh, every year, there's what's called the All Ireland Hurling Final. It's like the kind of the um, the uh, World Series in in baseball, but it's a single game. All comes down to one game, one seventy minutes of hurling, and it's played in a stadium called Croke Park in Dublin. And the capacity, typically, you're going to get eighty five to ninety thousand people at that final. So you get huge participation, and they pay to get in. And those that money is used then for the uh, the maintenance of the uh, the fields and the stadiums and the kind of the the uh, the facilities, uh, the showers and stuff like that. And for travel expenses, you know, these guys are going up by train, so their travel expenses are paid. And at the rural areas, the development of the local kinds of uh, communities is all coming from uh, subscriptions that the uh, the audience is paying. It can be anything from like two dollars to kind of forty dollars, depending on what the occasion is. But the players themselves are not receiving any money. So it all goes into infrastructure. Steve's final comment was that he says, I love that they stay with the same team their entire careers as right. well. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Unless you move from to, into another county. Yes. If you move into another county, you can st- you can you can represent a different club, a different village, wherever you're learning, wherever you're living, but you will always represent your own county of origin. So ah. if I went to Dublin and I'm playing with a local, you know, village in Dublin, you know, I can't obviously play with my village in Cork. But when it comes to if I get, if I get picked for the national scene, I play for Cork. So you'll always, your allegiance is always to your county of origin, even if you have to play in a different village because of relocating. And I love, uh, Sean, what you've said about the idea of uh, this playing it for its, playing the game for its own sake. You know, there's a the term auto telicity. Uh, the love of the activities you do. Absolutely. Doing it for for its own sake. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Tomorrow, other questions? 
Yeah, so we have a question from Scott Ford, one of our co-founders as well. He asks, what practices do you use to lift the veil between the mystical and the mundane? Wow, brilliant, brilliant. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to actually use one of them uh, finally for this uh, for this presentation today. I think there are many, many ways of altering st your state of consciousness. I think some of them are kind of, um, um, they happen spontaneously and some you can be accessed. For me personally, I've been meditating now for over 60 years. So meditation for me is a way in which I very, very quickly shift my state of consciousness. I advocate to people spending time in nature, particularly alone, because if you're in nature alone and you're not in conversation, you're not making any noise, you see nature doing stuff that you'll never see nature do if you're in conversation with another individual or a group of people. So spending time in nature alone is very important. I think spending time with little children, particularly between age two and five, because imagination is activated. And I differentiate between imagination and fantasy. Fantasy is the ability to make up stuff that's not real. Imagination is very different. Imagination is the ability to volitionally shift my state of consciousness, enter into different uh, dimensions, interact with entities and energies that reside in those dimensions, have the conversations with them and then bring that back to this side of the veil, you know, and, you know, learn from it back here. So imagination is an extraordinary way of, of moving through the veil. I think, you know, any form of ritual, whether it's music or dance or poetry or sculpture or sports, that these are ways in which we kind of very, very quickly shift our state of consciousness. Sometimes it happens, you know, kind of involuntarily, you know, if you're in great pain, or particularly if you're in a situation where you've got fever. I got malaria every year when I was in Kenya, and I would have these extraordinary kind of, uh, of fevers. And every time I did, I had mystical experiences. So the, the upside to malaria was I know I'm going to get a big download of mystical stuff at the other side. I think there are situations like, for instance, witnessing a tragedy occur. If you saw, for instance, a car accident, somebody being injured. So some of them come unbidden, and some of them you can kind of cultivate for yourself. So I think imagination, spending time with children, spending time in nature on your own, uh, meditation, that these are ones that all of us you know, can, uh, can do in order to create those kinds of uh, situations for ourselves. You know, Sean, uh, speaking of non-ordinary states of consciousness, it just uh, strikes me in watching the two video clips that Michael uh, was able to provide for us through you. Um, the fastest sport on grass in the world running at high speeds. And so I'm curious about this. You know, it's sort of like quarter horses because you're doing these sprints yes, yes. Uh, for 60, uh, right. 90, 100 yards. Yeah. I'm just curious what happens there. You know, with a lot of runners, and I've, I'm a mountain biker, same thing happens. You hit your second win. First, yeah. it's all that times you could hit the wall, you warm up, you hit your second yes. win. You experience the runner's high. Yes. yes. So does that translate into hurling? Very, very much. And as I say, you know, in the last, maybe since the 60s particularly, the the, the uh, training regimen is very, very different. I had a friend in, in university, a guy called Billy Collins. And uh, when he'd finished his degree, he went to England to study sports psychology. And he was the first person to really bring uh, sports psychology into hurling. You know, so before that, coaches were just local guys from the village, you know, uh, who had played hurling themselves but they had no great notion of sports psychology, apart from just uh, getting behind you and encouraging you and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So he brought, he brought it to a whole different level. And from that on, the preparation of these top guys particularly, you had weight training coming in for the first time ever. You had kind of a sprinting. You had people, you know, a mountain runs, literally a whole group being taken off to a mountain at five o'clock in the morning, you know, uh, run up to the top of the mountain and back down over the next five hours. And so the, um, the endurance training, you know, took, took off in, a, in an extraordinary way in the 1960s and afterwards. So now you've got a cadre of athletes, hurlers uh, from the 70s on. So you're talking about like you know, maybe 55 years where the training and the endurance would be much, much better than, than I had at, at my time because the quality of the training is very, very different with the emphasis on uh, both endurance and sprinting capacities. Beautiful. Well, and I would I would imagine uh, that uh, that that may have an impact between the first half and the second half as 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 people really step into their game, and right. you know I'm just reminded of this uh, beautiful 
interplay between the East and the West. As you talked about your meditation practice, contemplative practice, where it can take us into a certain place, uh, perhaps into our subliminal realms, but into these different states of consciousness. And the similarity that sports evokes, because this is, for me, this sports uh, is one of the most graphic displays of Western mysticism in that there is a tremendous amount of similarities between a flow state or getting into the zone yes. Yes. and a satori or a samadhi yes. experience yes. Yes. Uh, where these athletes are so elevated that not only is their performance elevated, but many of them talk about this idea that they are a part of something. I don't... Yeah, that's really interesting. I was hoping you could sort of tie that in with this notion of, you know, because uh, uh, because of your background, Christ consciousness right, and right. How, how that really plays in. Right. Brilliant. So for me, the, the term is Christ consciousness. Uh, the term Christ consciousness is interchangeable with a lot of other words, depending on which spiritual tradition you come from. So for me, it's the same notion as uh, Buddha nature. It's the same notion as self-realization. If you come from a Hindu background, so say, you know, that it's the very same notion that you're accessing a state of consciousness in which you're in contact with your source self. So I talk about, for instance, every day, I think I'm playing a role self, which is Sean, an Irishman. I'm playing a soul self, which is what my uh, my soul has volunteered to do in this particular incarnation. I call that my soul self. And then finally, I, I talk about my source self, because ultimately, you know, I think that everything that exists is simply God in drag, literally, that there is nothing that exists except God. And that, you know, that everything that we see in the phenomenological realms is a holographic fractal of source. Now, a hologram is an entity that contains the totality of itself in every one of its component parts. And a fractal is a pattern that repeats at an infinite number of scales. And so, in some senses, every rock, every bunny rabbit, every human being, you know, is a kind of an articulation of the divine. But the the thing that's different is perhaps the level of self-awareness. So a rock you know, isn't really fully conscious. It's reacting biochemically to rain or wind or or snow or whatever. A bunny rabbit has a different level of self-awareness. It's able to see. I watched a coyote ch- chase a rabbit outside my front uh, my front window a few days ago. So the level of the coyote and the rabbit is a level, different level of self-awareness. A human being has a different level of self-awareness and the great avatars have extraordinary levels of self-awareness. And so Christ consciousness has a kind of an awareness of his divine nature that very few other people they had. Maybe the Buddha, you know, maybe uh, Mother Teresa, maybe Mahatma Gandhi, you know, so that it's, it's only the awareness of who you really are that makes the difference. So the question then becomes, how can you kind of, um, how can you access that flow state on a regular basis? And I think great athletes are kind of um, accessing that. They may not know precisely how they got there, but they recognize the state when it happens to them. Now, I think uh, to kind of maybe just uh, preempt the presentation a little bit, when I look at the Hindu notion of body, that from source comes soul. The soul, there's a great Hebrew word for it, it's called netzotzim, that source self-fragmented into billions of souls, a kind of sparks of the divine, and they call it netzotzim. So that's the first level down from source. And then as we descend into different levels of densification, we go from uh, identification with the soul to identification with the psychic body. And the psychic body is where we're still in contact with, you know, telepathy, clairvoyance, clairaudience, clairsentience, um, you know, psychokinesis. We're still in contact with that. We come down a level and now we're at the mental body. Now we're in the, the, the place of uh, Plato's ideal realm, the place of the archetypal realities. We come down another level. We're in the astral body, now the dream body. At this stage, you know, there is no time and space, you know, our matter. Because when you dream at night, your mind is creating the entire experience you're having. So there is no time or space. I can dream of my grandfather, you know, who died in 1956, and I can meet him in my childhood home in Ireland, which is 6,000 miles to the east. I can do it tonight. So there's no time or space or matter at the astral body level. Then you come down to the, the, the second to last level. It's the etheric, the, il, the ilan vital, you know, the, the energy force. And then finally, the physiological. Now, what happens in a great sporting event? Somehow, a person can train themselves not just to identify with their physiology, 
They're going to maximize their phys physiology by weight training, you know, or running or whatever. So they're going to maximize their kind of physical body. But they're going to move into the etheric body as well. They're going to find that place, the Elan Vital, the energy system of which the physical body is simply a printout or a hard copy. They're accessing that. Then they go up to the, the astral level. And now at this stage, they're dreaming their performance into being. You know, it's outside of time and space. They don't even have to be on the field in order for this to happen. They're kind of, uh, they're preloading the kind of the sporting event by accessing that level. Then they go up to the mental level, the archetype of the hero. And there's the archetype of the hero is downloaded into the game. And now they're accessing the abilities of the kind of the Achilles, you know, Achilles of the world, you know, or the, the great heroes of, of the past. And then they go up to the, the psychic level. And now their intuitive faculties, their ability to read a situation, to kind of uh, preempt a situation, to kind of forecast what's going to happen. And now they're drawing from that piece. And so the athlete then, either consciously or unconsciously, is gaining access to those places. And that's going to separate the Michael Jordans of the world and the Steph Currys of the world from even really great athletes because they're drawing upon all those different levels of, of body. Boy, uh, Sean, it's mesmerizing. And I feel like uh, just your words alone uh, take us to those places uh, because uh, uh, what uh, I hear you just talking about a lot is is the subtle body. Yes. Uh, now, yes. you know, the gross cell yes. causal, there's all these wonderful different models for uh, uh, certainly. Um the idea uh, that was brought forth by Osensei, Morihai Oshiba, yes. uh, arguably the greatest uh, practitioner of the 20th century, the yep. founder of Aikido, the yep. way of harmonizing with the spirit of the universe, who yep. simply said, and by the way, it was not egotistical, it was a recognition That's of its cosmological origins, I am the universe. Yes, of course. So when you get to that point right. where we have the ability to inhabit these esoteric bodies that are already there, it's just a question of how we can connect with them. Yep. Then this Christ consciousness emerges. Yep. And these remarkable things, which you would call cities in the East, yep. uh, occur. And I think in sports, it's one of the things that so graphically demonstrates this phenomenon. Yes, I absolutely. think the other thing that we really need to understand is it's not really a phenomenon. It's <laughs> natural. This, this is, is who we are. Yes, this is the core. This is what we're hardwired to be. Absolutely. To be Absolutely. We just yeah. have to own it. Right. Anyway, uh, this, is this has been fantastic. And we do want to carve out some time because we talk about having the direct experience. So, Sean, right. we can step into that with you. Uh, okay, great. Moments. Great. Sure. Brilliant. Thanks a million, Barry. Thank and you. So, I'm going to call this some kind of a spiritual practice, but spiritual in the sense that I'm not talking about religion at all. I'm talking about the mystical reality, the, the underlying you know, ground of our being. And so, um, as I said, there are many, many ways in order to enter into an altered state of consciousness, non-ordinary states of consciousness. And as I say, some of them are voluntary and some of them are involuntary. And so I've mentioned some of the voluntary mechanisms like meditation and spending time with little children and, and, and joining in their games. Because children between age two and five, they're going across the veil constantly. So when you join in a child's game, it's not about patronizing. You say, oh, yeah, that's very fine. That's a great story. It's realizing they're having experiences that are kind of, you know, that most of us don't have anymore because our imagination has been shut down by education, alleged education. And so to join in a kid's games and really believe that they're, they're teaching you and they're leading you. You're not there to pat their curly head and say, oh, yeah, great, that's lovely. So spending time with little children, dance, music, poetry, art, ritual, yeah, uh, plant medicine, whether it's ayahuasca or peyote or whatever, and sport. These are all voluntary ways in which you can induce an altered state of consciousness. Then, as I say, they're in involuntary situations, like being in extreme pain or in fever particularly or witnessing a tragedy. But the one that I want to focus on today, I've mentioned already, is imagination. And as I say, I differentiate between imagination and fantasy. Fantasy is just the ability to make up stuff that's not real. Imagination is to kind of hone the skill of uh, intentionally altering my state of consciousness, entering into different domains and dimensions, encountering energies and entities who reside there, interacting with them, dialoguing with them, learning from them, and then bringing that back here, you know, and cross-fertilizing it with this awakening consciousness, allegedly, what Carl Jung would have called a Gnostic intermediary, 
a Gnostic intermediary is somebody who's so well versed in two totally different systems that she can cross fertilize them to their mutual benefit. And that's what we're meant to do by crossing through the veil and coming back, that we're bringing back information, which is really important to us right now. Now, as I begin this practice this today, I want to make a further distinction for myself. I believe that there's a that uh, there's a big difference between truth and fact. Something can be true, but not factual, and something can be factual but not true. So here's my definition of truth. Something is true if it transforms me and aligns me with God. And something is ultimate truth if it transforms me radically and aligns me permanently with God. So whether the avenue to this transformation is through a ritual or dance or, you know, ayahuasca or meditation, you know, or imagination, whatever it is, you know, whatever transforms you such that you're aligned with source and whatever transforms you so radically that you're aligned permanently with source, I would say that is your truth. And so when I lead you in this little visualization for the next few minutes, I'm inviting you to kind of set aside your rational objections and just for the fun and for the evolution, engage in the following exercise. So a very short breathing technique, a very short muscle rel relaxation, and then a visualization. So if you feel comfortable, I invite you now just to kind of close your eyes. And breathe in as comfortable, as deeply as feels comfortable to you at your own pace. And I want you just to see if you can detect the difference in temperature between the in-breath and the out-breath in your nostrils. If you breathe in and out through your nostrils, can you detect a temperature difference between the in-breath and the out-breath? And you realize that um, in many, many languages, the word for breath and life and spirit are the same word. In Hebrew, they call it ruach. In Greek, it's called pneuma. So literally, breath is the interface between spirit and matter. And so by breathing, you're actually in a dialogue. And as you're breathing, you realize as well that every time you breathe in, you're taking fresh oxygen into your lungs, which is transferred into your bloodstream. And then your blood, your heart beats, and it's, it sends this oxygenated blood all over your body. So for the next few breaths, I want you to know, imagine you're taking a breath, and this um, love-saturated blood of yours is being ushered right down to the soles of your feet. And every time you breathe in, you feel the relaxation in that part of your body. And every time you breathe out, you let go of any tension or pain in that part of your body. And for your second breath, I want you to imagine that this oxygenated blood, this spirit-filled you know, liquid, is coursing down into your shins and your calves and your knees. And every place it touches, it brings healing and it brings peace. And every time you breathe out now, you can let go of any discomfort or pain in that part of your body and relax a little more. And in your next breath, I want you to imagine this healing, loving, spirit-filled energy moving down into your thighs and quadriceps and buttocks and every place it touches, it brings healing and it brings peace. And every time you breathe out now, you can let go of any tension or pain or discomfort in that part of your body and relax a little more. And with your next breath, I want you to imagine the spirit-filled liquid moving down into your torso, stomach, Rib cage, and all of the internal organs, your kidneys, your liver, your spleen, your heart, your lungs. And every place it touches, 
it brings healing and it brings peace. And every time you breathe out now, you can let go of any pain or tension or anxiety in that part of your body and relax even more deeply. And with your next breath, I want you to imagine this spirit-filled liquid moving up into your throat and chin and jaw, into your face and cheeks and eyes and ears, up into your forehead and the back of your head and the crown of your head, touching all of the internal parts, your intellect, your imagination, your willpower, your memories. And every place it touches, it brings healing and it brings peace. And every time you breathe out now, you can let go of any anxiety or concerns and relax. And with your final breath, I want you to imagine this spirit-filled liquid coursing from your shoulders down into your biceps and triceps, through your elbows, into your forearms and wrists, into your hands and fingers. And every place it touches, it brings healing and it brings peace. And every time you breathe out now, you can let go of any residual discomfort or pain in that part of your body and relax completely. And in that relaxed state, I want to take you on a journey. I want to start by sharing with you some really powerful visions I had last year when I had a fever. And in this fever of mine, I could see I had an encounter with Source, God. I could see that God was spinning off holographic fractals of herself. And as I say, a hologram is an entity that contains the totality of itself in every one of its component parts. And a fractal is simply a pattern that repeats at an infinite number of scales. So God spun off these souls, these nets would seem, these sparks of the divine. And then God called a conference. I call it a pre-cosmos, cosmic conference. And God and the souls decided, let's do something for fun. What can we do? And the decision was to create a cosmos. To imagine what it would be like be to be to be co-creators, that source and souls cooperated to create this extraordinary cosmos of ours. And there were witnesses to this extraordinary creation of theirs. It's what Buddhism would call Turiya, witnessing consciousness, that they're in awe of that which they have just created. And then at some stage, God called a second conference. He said, can we do something else besides just creating a conference that we can admire from a distance? And the decision was made to create um, avatars that could be inserted into the cosmos playing particular kinds of roles, avatars, so that you have what cultural anthropology will call participant observers, not just observers or witnesses, but participants as well. And Buddhism will call this Turiyatita, the ability to walk in two legs, to participate in incarnation, and at the same time not to identify with that. And so we became members, we inserted ourselves into this cosmos, and different souls volunteered for different le levels of density to experience what would it be like to uh, appear to be separated from the source. And so there were seven different levels then created, as I mentioned. There's the source itself, then there's the soul, then there's the psychic, the psychic body, then there's the mental body, then the astral body, then the etheric body, and finally the physical body. And in these different levels, the kind of the game of Lila is even in the density of a three-dimensional space suit, in which I'm suffering from amnesia, in which, you know, my cosmic being is reduced to this little 150-pound space suit that I, that I walk around in, in which my cosmic intelligence is a kind of downsized to this little three-pound mass of wet wear that I carry between my ears, which is so small that I cannot grok the gestalt, so I have to break it up into bite-sized pieces and process them sequentially, thus giving rise to the illusion of time. 
and then forgetting who I am, where I've come from, and what my purpose is. Can I work with that level of the game and still remember at some stage of who I am and who God is? Now, I think sports is an invitation to do that. Sports is an invitation to develop my physical body through weight training or diet or sleep regimens or whatever, but not just to identify with that level of myself, to realize that there is an etheric level to me, that there is an energy system, that, that there is the kind of the, the, the elan vital, the vital force, you know, of which the physical body is a printout or a hard copy. Can I access that uh, through my sport? Can I bring my astral body into play? Can I dream a perfect, you know, performance for me and for my team? Can I go to my mental body, to the platonic realm, the place of the archetypes, and I kind of find what is the ideal form? Who are the heroes of the past whom I can imitate, but more importantly than just imitate, that I can draw upon the same kind of energy upon which they drew? Can I access the psychic level of me so that my intuition is telling me where to be, where to hit the ball, not just where my kind of teammate is, but where he's going to be when the ball reaches him? Can I access those? And sociologically, can I utilize my sports for human transformation, to transform myself, my team, my family, my village, my city, my culture, my species? So the sociology of sport. So that sports has a kind of a transformative force for humanity itself. And the realization that there's a difference between free will and freedom. Free will is the ability to do as I please. Freedom is the ability to do as God pleases. So every single one of us exercise free will in choosing to be incarnated. But when you decide to play a particular game, then you agree to play according to the rules of that game. The rules of soccer and NFL and rugby and hurling are very different. The ball is different. The rules are different. You know. So once you agree to participate in a game, you agree to abide by the rules of the game. But you're not abandoning free will because your free will uh, is what allowed you to choose the particular game you're in. And the game you're in is the game of life, the game of Lila. So now you came down, I believe, bearing two kinds of gifts. The first level is your talents. And the second gift you came down were the problems you came in with. So your talents do not belong to you. Your talents are like letters in the bag of a mailman. You were sent down to deliver these letters to the people whose names are on the envelopes. So a talent is an invitation to be a mailman for the world, to dispense the gifts that God is putting into your satchel. It's, you're, in, you're entitled to make a living from your talents, but you're not entitled to make a killing from your talents. And the second gift you come down with are the problems you want to work on in your lifetime, because a problem is an invitation to self-transcendence. A problem is not just begging solutions, it's begging self-transcendence so that you disidentify with lower versions of who you think you are in order to re-identify with greater versions of who you are. To realize that you volunteered to be here now. You are not here by mistake. You didn't take a wrong turn at Andromeda and find yourself, you know, in the Milky Way galaxy. The question I ask then is, what talents and what problems have you brought? What has been and what still is your mission? And how has the fractal of your sports life been a hologram for your soul's journey? How and to whom have you inspired by your sports life? Namaste, my brothers and sisters. Wow, that was... Incredible. Thank you so much. Thanks, Tamara. Amazing. What an amazing way to kind of finish up and wrap up a quite an insightful call. Um, I am putting some links in the chat. Uh, sorry if I dinged you on the other side when I added, sent some earlier um, to keep in touch with Father Sean. So that includes his website, uh, some of his books as well. 
and the two videos that were shared today. Um, so yeah, thank you all for coming in and attending the call today and spending your Thursday afternoon with us. Uh, thank you, Father Sean, for such an incredible and insightful call. I know seeing the comments in the chat box, I don't know if you've had the chance to see them, but people have definitely gained insight from the call today, which is great to hear. Um, a recording as long as some notes and nuggets will be sent out um, afterwards once we get that as well. So you can all have access to that. Um, in addition, I am putting in some Evo links. So we have our membership link. Um, you can gain access to all of our recordings of our master's calls and coaches calls for $10 a month uh, through our membership. Um, and uh, links to our social media and Facebook. I am also putting in a link to a donation page. Um, Barry, if you'd like to speak on that a little bit more as well. Yeah, thanks, Tamara, and thanks for everything you do. Um, first off, uh, Sean, somebody yeah. made the comment that uh, it may we may have a levitation experience. Thank you for taking us <laughs> somewhere uh, into the cosmos. That was spectacular. And this is what good experiential practice is all about. Bless you, my friend, for being on this call. I mean, More to you. come. More to come. Uh, a couple Thank of things. Sure. The uh, That donation link. So, folks, we're a 501c3 nonprofit with not a lot of money, honestly. And so whatever support you can provide, $10 a month or a, 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 you know, just a, a one-time donation would be dearly, dearly appreciated. Um. There's one other thing uh, to talk about. This is from all of us. We're not really political on the airwaves. We certainly are in our own lives. But we want to encourage everybody to vote. And not only that, to put out the word to other people, to vote, to take uh, advantage of this gift that we've been given. This is a gift. This isn't this is earned. This isn't something that this country inherited. This country earned it. Uh, so at any rate, particularly during these times of separation and division, we have an opportunity uh, to voice how we feel and also to follow Sean's path of unity, of recognizing that we really are all one. When all of these superficial uh, divisions are taken away, when you look through the face of each one of us to our souls, we are all connected, we are all one. So I really want to encourage you to do that. And then lastly, tomorrow, uh, perhaps you could just mention the next uh, in our series so that people can be cued in on that as well. Yeah, absolutely. So our next um, session for our master series will be October 17th um, with Robert Nadeau and Sue Ann McKean. So we're really looking forward to that. Uh, more information will be sent out as well um, and posted on our website and everything. So you should all hear about that soon. Fantastic. Hey, John. Thank you. Sean, thank you. Brilliant. Just I mean, absolutely nice. brilliant. <laughs> okay. Thank you for stretching us. <laughs> and here's to evolution, folks. Thanks for being uh, on the call. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much, Sean. God bless, guys. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank Sean, you. just before you go away, you had yes. a you had a collision with church over women's ordination, I heard. Yes, I did. There was an inquiry. Are there any female mm -hmm. playing hurlers? Yes, there are. Yeah, absolutely. It's called Komogi. Yeah. And oh, really, oh, wonderful. It's wonderful. called Komogi. Yes. The women are just as involved as the men in this. Absolutely. I should have I should have mentioned that. In the yeah. chat. Thank you. Right. Here's to the women. Yeah. Here's to the women. Yeah. All right, folks. Until next time. Thanks for being on this call. Thanks, Bye. Barry. Yeah. Way to go. Good bless, guys. Well, I got bye. 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 Say hi to say hi to your grandpa for me. <laughs> Thanks, <Sean. Hey> ho. <laughs> Hugs to Scranton, Pennsylvania. Absolutely. Bye. Bye. Love you. Uh -huh. uh, all right. Bye everyone. Thanks, guys. <laughs>